Welcome to the Good Growing Podcast. I am Chris Enroth, horticulture educator with University of Illinois Extension, coming at you from Macomb, Illinois, and we have got a great show for you today. We're going to be talking about a different type of strawberry. We're still talking about strawberries, but they're coming around in the fall, which is weird to me, but Grant McCarty is going to be here, and he is going to tell us all about this interesting, we won't call it new crop, but new to me, we'll say that much but I cannot do this alone. You know I have to bring in our co-host with us every single week. We are joined by horticulture educator Ken Johnson in Jacksonville. Hey, Ken. Hello, Chris. All strawberries are new to me too, so. Okay. We're, <laughs> we're on this journey together. We'll <laughs> learn together, and we'll be making wine all year long out of strawberries, so yeah, we'll be set. Yes. We've already got a freezer full, so. <laughs> exactly. You know, uh, in, in terms of kind of current conditions, what we're looking at, we're about to hit autumn or fall equinox. Like it's about to be the end of summer. It's about to start the start the fall. And it's hot. Like today, as we record, it's 92 degrees uh, in Macomb. Um, and then tomorrow, the bottom's dropping out. Are you ready for this, Ken? Uh, yes, I am tired of hot weather. I think when I when I put some uh, row cover, thank you for mm -hmm. that over our ginger. Well, so mm -hmm. that's all ready for the forties. Hopefully, hopefully yes. I put it on right and it doesn't all fly off and I just wasted my time. But <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> well, if you have like I have these landscape staples that I use to hold the row cover down, and I basically put so many landscape staples on it, it becomes a pain in the neck to try to take it off. So um, that row cover it isn't going anywhere when i get through with it so um but but yeah so it's getting chilly it's finally fall and the beards are going to start coming back in handy so i'm excited for that exactly <laughs> <laughs> well i mean uh, speaking of fall we better introduce our guest with us this week so uh, we are joined by local foods small farms educator grant mccarty grant welcome to the show hey thanks for having me well, we are happy to have you here once again uh, to the Good Growing Podcast, and uh, there seems to be a, a, a ongoing theme with uh, every time you you pop in every year in the fall time frame. It seems like, and so we we got to chat, uh, you know, all about uh, fall and 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 kind of what the season was like and everything. But but Ken, why don't you kick us off on uh, this week's line of questioning for Grant? All right, before we get to the main show, we'll ask perhaps the most important question. What weird stuff did you grow this year? Ah, uh, right. I mean, like that seems to be the the trend every year when we when we talk. It's like, <laughs> what was the weird stuff? And it was one of those things where I was um, I was reflecting a bit about that question, and I realized it wasn't as weird as it could have been. I guess was I, I'm I'm getting stuck in my ways is the problem. Um, <laughs> and I realized this at a uh, a neighborhood gathering in July where. Uh, a neighbor who you know just grows tomatoes on the side showed up with these weird unusual tomatoes that I hadn't ever seen really before and I looked at my tomatoes that day and was like we got to get we got to get back on track and have weirder ones next oh, year you don't tell me you're just growing celebrity or I'm no 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 but okay, I, I okay. have this you know it's a sun gold orange cherry tomatoes it's cherry boring well <laughs> I'm kidding they're delicious they're still really good they're good they're good but I could do better um you know I think what I've talked to you all before you know you know a lot of times we grow a lot of eggplant and that wasn't anything different this year we grew um you can kind of see this is frog eye eggplant. It's a Thai eggplant. It's beautiful. So it's really small and it, it should be a little bit bigger than this. Um, but we grew it in containers since my family tends to eat a lot of eggplant. Um, it's a smaller one. It doesn't have that big globe shape to it. And it works pretty well for containers. Um, we always have kind of traditional kind of like the Japanese style eggplant, which you can kind of see here. Mm -hmm. I mean, pretty normal ones. Um, I guess the the weirdest thing we grew this year was pink okra. Um, so you can see it, you know, as much as we might call it pink, it's a little bit more of like a reddish kind of color to it than anything. Um, it does cook out. So you when you cook okra, question. it's mm -hmm. gonna go back to its normal color. The thing that is kind of unusual with it, I think, is that some of these are really, they're pretty big and yet they're still flexible you can still eat them compared to other okra where if it gets this size sometimes 
sometimes you, you can't cut it. It's just too tough. Um, and the, the plant's beautiful. It's a beautiful plant. It produces uh, wonderful hibiscus like flowers. Um, we have our okra in the front of our yard, just as you come into our door, there's massive okra plants and it, it looks great. And uh, I was down in Tennessee visiting relatives Labor Day weekend and saw like okra in, in the south. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say it. I think okra grows better in the Midwest. I, I think it's oh my uh oh I, this, this uh, is you can send your emails <laughs> to a bold, Greg McCarty. Bold statement. Yeah. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> but uh the plants look better up here. We're not eating it always, but they, they look really good. Um and then yeah, you know, the final thing was we grew about 25 to 30 different varieties of dahlias, which you can see on your screen. So mm -hmm. we have dinner plate ones, we have kind of smaller ones that are a little more delicate. Um kind of different colors within here. Um, you know, I think you, you, Chris, and you can, you understand, like you go big for some of these things you just get started in. So we had 180 Dahlia plants went out, 25 to 30 varieties, spacing different sizes to see how they do and um, was just curious about it. So we're gonna, we need to listen to the uh, the webinar next week to know how to store them back. That's what we need to do <laughs> with our Dahlia tubers that I think Christine is doing. Yes. Um, so yeah, that's been the season. I mean, it's been a lot of like normal stuff, but then it's also a lot of flowers. And there was concern early in the spring with family members that they weren't going to have anything to eat, that it was all going to be dahlias. And um, <laughs> we, 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 it's a, we balanced it out. We balanced it out. So. That's good. That's good. Yeah. I, I'll say my dahlias this year. So I, I've stored them. Um, I basically have fabric pots and I fill them with just a dry potting mix every winter and I throw the the tubers in there. They're tubers, right? Or yeah, maybe. They're, okay. And you throw those in there and I throw them in the basement and I kind of ignore them till springtime. And then I just, I bring the pots out onto the back porch and then just let it rain on them. And then huh. eventually they sprout. Um, but my dahlias did awful this year. I actually, hmm. they did so bad. I'm saying I'm throwing them out at the end of the season. I'm, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to get a fresh batch because these are old fashioned ones that I got from um an old older garden and so um and so I, I think i need to get fresher newer bread dahlias because these these were exhausted so yeah it might be my technique because i'm a lazy gardener and you know when you're in my yard you're on your own so you better yeah well it's weight. hard to the dahlia stuff especially just kind of jumping in i mean i wanted to kind of connect with flower farmers because flower farmers in our region are growing them i was just kind of curious how they grow and and to acquire all these different dahlia tubers a lot of it depends on buying from dahlia farms and you know you have to follow them on social media and as soon as the clock strikes whatever for their online store to open i mean you may have in mind that you want to buy 10 varieties and they're gone like mm -hmm. it is is a gold rush of dahlia tubers right now is what we're seeing. Interesting. And and you are doing cut flower dahlias. Is that kind of where your focus is or a, is yeah. there a distinction there? That's correct. So we're doing cut flower dahlias kind of with an idea of, of building up some, some tuber supply and, and seeing different spacing. Uh, some of them have also had some cuttings from them too as tubers have come in and developed them along. So just curious about it more than anything. And the thing I've heard about dahlias is that kind of like tomatoes, when you plant them, you can plant them a little bit deeper so they're not as floppy. Is that something that you uh, you did when you planted your dahlias? I did, yeah. So I put them at a lower depth to it. And then, you know, for some guidance, it says to plant, say, a foot between tubers. I tried six inches i tried uh, about eight inches and i think i did 10 inches as well with just different spacing with the idea that you know as they get taller they could support one another yeah. with it too we also did a late planting so we held back tubers to plant July, the first week of july as well as some the end of may and really there was no difference in um flower development when the flowers mm -hmm. showed up but there could be differences in tubers we, we yeah. won't know for a couple more weeks because then you have to wait for the next probably is it a killing frost that you wait for or is it just maybe the first light frost that we probably would the first killing frost will will 
kind of cut all of the, the growth on it. But I think the, the challenge with growing dahlias, especially growing with like, like too many as some family members mm -hmm. might say, um, <laughs> is that we have to flag every single one as it flowers yeah. because if we just dig up all these tubers, there's no way for us to know which one is which. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for very scientifically like, people as as we all are this is awesome like it's yeah. just really cool just to be tracking every single minute thing someone growing this on a you know commercial scale is probably not going to as much detail as, <laughs> as i mm -hmm. might be doing so we planted ours we drew out a map <clears throat> i don't know where the map is currently no <laughs> <laughs> that has failed you now <laughs> we, yeah we we mapped everything on ours flopped a lot this year. I don't think we planted them deep enough. And last couple of weeks now that we've gotten some rain that's cooled off a little bit. They look infinitely better than they did yeah. this summer. I think the well, the spider mite article I did, all those pictures of spider mites were from my dahlias. They were mm. absolutely I mean I thought it was awesome looking at them just just globs of spider mites everywhere. But right. <laughs> the plants the plants did not like it. Yeah, yeah. No, it's yeah, it's just a fascinating to kind of shift from, you know, I'm so used to fruit and vegetable production to something that is un, not edible. Well, I think you can eat the dahlia tubers if you so choose, um, but I don't know how how well they would taste. Um, but to kind of shift kind of my thinking, uh, it's been an interesting summer to do that. Well, Ken, I, I think we we talked about some of the weird things you've grown, but any updates on oh, yeah. um, what's happening in your yard right now? <laughs> Uh, so this weekend, we uh, cleaned out all the tomatoes. I'm done with tomatoes. I don't want to see them anymore. <laughs> um, so that bed, we cleaned out all the tomatoes, some of the peppers, um, planted our cover crop, which is a little late, but it's in. This weekend, I pulled all of our uh, pumpkins out because um, they're pretty much done. Rice. So we've got two different kinds of rice. One of them is a, a shorter season one bread for northern climates. That's got... It's probably pretty close to harvest. Mm. Um, the other one, which is one I grew last year, we got out a little bit later this year, um, and it's just starting to put out um, the rice. So we'll see if that has enough time to to um, develop fully before harvest and stuff. So, are those new varieties for you this year? the The shorter the the one bred for the northern climates is. Um, I'm trying to think of the other, the bigger one. I'm drawing a blank on what variety it is, but we grew that last year too. Um, so, and it was the little bit I've eaten is pretty good. We still have a Tupperware container full of it that I need to de hole, but uh, I have not found an easy way to do that other than rubbing it between two boards, and which takes forever to do. And my wife won't let me get a several hundred dollar <laughs> deal there, so. just for your little experimental rice patty yes. yeah. <laughs> and that, i think artichokes those are pretty much done um and stuff we got some harvest off those let one flower which we showed a couple weeks ago we showed a picture yeah. of that so is it around as an annual or you know it's perennial the artichoke i'll probably just leave them in the ground <clears throat> see what happens um, yeah. I'll probably order some more seed just in case, but yeah, we'll see if they come back or not. I'm, so, I'm our... still upset about this, Ken. So I just want you to know, because <laughs> I work so hard on my artichokes <laughs> early, late winter, early spring to get them exposed to those cold temperatures and get them in the ground and might have done nothing. And you, you yeah. didn't do anything. You just planted so, it. Well, we got another one that was a short season. Because uh, I didn't want to have to deal with all the stuff you were doing. Yeah, I know. So, I know. Mine yeah. are just sit, just these little basil foliage group. Then blah. I don't know. I mean, they're kind of pretty, but yeah, it's about all they done. Being lazy pays off sometimes. Yeah, I guess it does. <laughs> I stop trying on everything. Yeah, yeah. The, well, so the last new plant we're growing, we got another cotton that's brown. Um, We've got bowls, but they haven't opened up yet, so I can't report. What are you going to do with your cotton? We just have bags of it sitting around the house that we picked from previous years. <laughs> <laughs> so started, we started growing it three, four years ago. Our oldest oh. son wanted to grow some, so I'm like, sure, why not? Yeah. And yeah, we just have like grocery bags here and there, full of cotton. You just got to 
spin that into some some yeah. yarn and then you'll 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 be knitting before you know it so yeah <laughs> Oh man. Well, I, I can't say what are the weird things that I might've grown. So I, we did pump, we did a couple different types of pumpkins this year, M mostly the, the blue Jaradale pumpkin, which is new for me. Not, not really new for most other people, but um, it's probably the, we planted them late and I don't know, maybe it, it, it could be maybe because we didn't have much rain where I'm located here in Macomb for from like mid June till now. And it is the biggest, most beautiful pumpkin plant I've ever seen. Like one singular Jaradale um, is taken over a large corner of my yard. There's like no disease. It's just bright green. The leaves are massive. Um, it's just a, a massive, beautiful plant. And I did nothing to deserve any credit for that. Just, <laughs> it's, it's pretty amazing. All the other pumpkins that we have, um, like some of the jack-o'-lanterns, uh, they're just, you know, they're, they look terrible. <laughs> so, uh, but Jaradale looks excellent. Um, and I'll say I did not grow these, but um, our local WIU Hort professor, uh, Shelby Henning, he has these. These um, are actually eggplant, um, African eggplants, what he called them. Um, but, uh, oh man, I just lost the name. It was in my head. But then dendron dendron uh di dichondra i think is what they might call it is a common name yeah. um and then i'll pop the scientific name below here because i've only read it I, I don't know how to say it what is it ken <laughs> <laughs> i don't know <laughs> but these plants are growing in this high tunnel in macomb and it looks like an eggplant plant but it's covered in spines so it's it's a brutal looking plant because uh, it kind of it reminds me a bit of like the goji berry plant yeah. way. I wonder if there's like some lineage there because I think goji maybe might be in that same family and maybe there's like a split there where there's some origin like color and even like some of the shape I wonder. It, it looks like a tiny red pumpkin kind of yeah. but yeah it's a it's a Sol solanum genus so um and Dr. Henning, he did say it tastes kind of like vomit. So I don't, he's like, maybe I didn't make it properly, but he said it wasn't very good when he did try it. So, huh. um, and then another one that I did not grow is this Victorian lemon, which um, we're doing a rain garden program with historic Nauvoo. And um, the kind of an interesting background is that um, the, the Mormons early on, um, when they would send missionaries out, they were kind of like botanists and they would collect things from around the world and bring them back to North America. So they have massive plant collections. And so um, it's just really interesting. So this is a Victorian lemon. This is an actual lemon. It smells sweet, like lemonade. Mm -hmm. um, and this is something that you would find in like the Renaissance French Italian conservatories, glass houses that they would have way back when. So um it's a very old fashioned type lemon. So next job on my list is to figure out how to propagate the seed that is most likely inside here. Yeah. You have to tell us how many cups of lemon juice you get off <laughs> that one lemon. Like. Exactly. So, yeah. And, and listeners, if you're listening to this, we'll throw a YouTube link below. You can pop over to a YouTube channel to see this stuff, but just visually, this is bigger than a softball. Um, it's like, big as my head practically so yeah it's big <laughs> start building your greenhouse yeah oh, my goodness that's a whole other <laughs> that's a whole other tale as old as time if you do let me know i'll bring some plants up there i know you have a I'm lot of got a room <laughs> <laughs> i'm i'm gonna start leasing greenhouse space that should be a business somebody operates so yeah i imagine <laughs> someone would take him up on that so, well, anyway, we should probably get to the topic at hand today. We could talk about weird stuff all day long. So, um, Grant, about strawberries. So, I want to tell you a little, just a tiny little story. I had a friend, um, and he had strawberry plants, and he was not happy because he was not getting any strawberries. June came around, no strawberries. So, he said, Chris, do you want these plants? I'm going to rip them out. They weren't doing anything. I had them in for a year. And I said, sure, I'll try them. So I put them in my garden, had them in for a year. This past June comes along, 
nothing. I'm like, man, these must just be defunct strawberries. They just don't work. And then I just left them in the ground. I actually planted carrots around them and just sort of ignored them. And then two weeks ago, the plant just, just kind of bushed up and flowered. And now I have strawberries developing. <laughs> and so I'm like, what is going on here? So Grant, do I have a June bearing strawberry? What, what do I have in my garden? Are there different types of strawberries? So there are different types of strawberries. Um, you know, you've, you've got three basic ones. You've got the June bearing that we're all pretty accustomed to, which is perennial that is going to produce strawberries after, you know, a single year of establishment. Um, you've got everbearing, which might be the one that you're dealing with, where typically you probably would need an establishment year. And then it's going to be dictated by day length, so 12 hours of length, where it then should be producing three times over the course of the season. Um, and then your final one is day neutral. Sometimes day neutral get combined with, with everbearing, but really we want to think about this as two different pieces because everbearing is three times, uh, yielding three times in the season, whereas day neutrals you're yielding, uh, at least for us in our research, you're yielding from end of July all the way to Halloween on a weekly schedule, and we're treating it as an annual. So my thinking is that you have an everbearing that is confused. Maybe that's where we put it at. Like, I, it, I'll, I'll go with that one. The yeah. everbearing, <laughs> the strawberry and the gardener are confused. Right. And so <laughs> we're trying to figure yeah. out what each other is doing. Have so with this confused strawberry plant, have you done any irrigation this season or has it all been rain that it's been irrigated by? So since I planted those carrots nearby, I've actually been pretty, um, pretty good with irrigation in okay. this spot. And this is a special spot with soil that I prepared um, in the garden. Uh, I've, I've added a couple amendments, compost and things like that. And so um, with the carrots and also parsnips nearby, I have been irrigating pretty di diligently because I want to hold some of these over into winter. Um, so we're trying to get, I'm trying to get as big root development as I can. So I want to see how, how bad is the flavor going to become if I get this like big old thing or if it can, I, can I maintain like something good? So I'm going to see, I'm going to see if that cold weather is going to give me a little bit of sugar or something. I don't know, but sure. um, it's nice soil. It's been irrigated. Because one of the things we have encountered with our, our day neutral strawberries is that one of our sites is drip irrigated plastic culture. The other site, there's no irrigation. It's just, it's just rain irrigation or it's just rainfall. That's the irrigation, I guess. Mm -hmm. And what we have found is that with irrigation, you know, we were starting to pick the end of July without irrigation. The first harvest for these day neutrals was really the end of August. So mm -hmm. there was a bit of a delay there, which, you know, as I'm thinking about your strawberry, if it's not getting that consistent irrigation, along with just it's, you know, trying to figure out who it wants to be and become, it could be why you've had such a delay in the flowering and in that fruiting system, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Well, this this mystery is 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 growing and growing here. So, I guess I'm just gonna have to taste them and just say, um, yeah, I'm just gonna have to see what this this thing tastes like. So, and there is, you know, typically between between flower and fruiting, a four to six week window. So, whenever those flowers are appearing and when they show up, you should expect to then have them from four to six weeks later actually picking that fruit, dependent of course on pollination and other pieces but that's at least kind of one way to really look at it. Okay. Okay. Well, I'll just, I'll keep growing and see what happens. <laughs> so we've mentioned your, your research a little bit. So let's dive a little deeper into that. Why, why are you interested in, in um, fall strawberries in particular? Sure. Yeah. So a lot of, uh, so the research to give you some background of kind of how we got there was that, you know, when talking to growers, fruit and vegetable growers with you pick strawberries of June bearing with apple orchards, with those in agritourism industry, um, all of them have seen growth in small fruits. That tends to be where the growth is really happening. When it comes to them determining what they want to plant every year and put something new, it is in the small fruits. 
And when you actually look at some of the, the, the census, uh, ag census for Illinois, you also see quite a bit of small fruit acreage being added up in Northern Illinois. Um, almost all the growers that we're also working with um, are highly dependent on Chicago. Like it's dependent on people leaving the city of Chicago to come out and pick strawberries, go to the apple orchard, um, not only just you know an hour outside of Chicago, but traveling all the way across that northern corridor to Joe Davis County uh, and doing you pick straw uh, fruit. So there was some interest there um, in in that we knew small fruit was the way to go, and what I was thinking about with research. Um, as we kind of know with blueberries, they're a little bit tricky because you have to modify the soil. With blackberries and raspberries, you need establishment year, so that can take some time with it too. And really, it was also coming back from a place of that there are increasingly environmental issues with strawberries in the June bearing system. Um, because this is a UPIC system and it's predominantly focused on people coming to the farm, the strawberries are ripening the end of June and a couple weeks into July. And if it's too hot, if it's too wet, no one wants to come to the strawberry fields. You compare that to maybe other strawberry farms in the state that aren't, say, dependent on you pick, where you're paying someone to go out and pick the strawberries and they'll just come back. Uh, they won't come back because you paid them, right? Compared to having someone go out and do it themselves. Um, we also have issues with overwintering and we have very cold, wet springs that were reducing some of the strawberry severity. The other thing was from an economics point of view, because as much as the environmental was sometimes impacting strawberry you pick operations, they were also selling out with sometimes with whatever they have available. There is such increasing demand from the Chicago region for you pick strawberries that the strawberries weren't making it anywhere else. They weren't, they were only leaving the farm, you know, in the back back of cars from Cook County. They weren't making it to grocery stores. They weren't going into restaurants. It was just like, you know, they were selling out really well with it. So there's all these other markets that could be tapped that haven't been tapped with it. Um, so environmentally, economically, where we think I was thinking strawberries. And then uh, just kind of where I'm located, I depend a lot on Wisconsin and Minnesota research. You know, I'm an hour and a half from UW-Madison. Um, a lot of the research from Minnesota, Wisconsin has impact with our growers on the state line. And they were saying quite a bit about day neutral strawberries, that, you know, growing strawberries in an annual system um, and removing them at the end of the season could address some of those pieces that our growers are dealing with. Um, and we also, what I also was thinking about with the day neutrals was that we could study these strawberries in the variety trial to see if it works for an apple orchard or a regular strawberry you pick, but we could also see it working for a mixed vegetable CSA operation or a farmer's market vendor that brings strawberries to the farm because you've got your you know row of tomatoes, your row of peppers, your row of strawberries. October 31st arrives and you just remove the strawberries. And yet you're also able to say, hey, if you sign up for a CSA, you will get fresh strawberries mid-August to Halloween. I mean, that's a huge selling point. And it's all field grown. This isn't greenhouse. Yes, there is some greenhouse or there is some low tunnels and others. But a lot of this is just field grown strawberries that are coming on board right now. Um, so that's kind of how we got there, was that there were pieces that we're hoping this study is going to answer, while also recognizing that it's worked in other places, could it work here? Um, and I think there's a lot to be said that I don't have to wait a year to determine whether it can work. Yeah, that's, that's so do you think in part of the consumer, will there be confusion when they see fresh field grown strawberries in October? Will they be like, no, they're lying. They can't be doing that. Like they're they're trucking these up from Florida, right? Yeah, and I think that that's that's the big hesitation is you know when we at the end of this two year study funded by you know the USDA Special Crop Block Grant, we're going to have information for a grower to with capital and and with the time and investment of marketing 
to really seize upon this education and to seize upon the ability to potentially implement it if everything is economically working for them. But it also is going to mean shifting, you know, someone's thinking over to when strawberries should be available. I think we're also at a place, especially with some of our Chicago land region and markets, we already have a lot of greenhouse tomatoes being grown. So it's that's happening year round and consumers are interested in that. So I think it's not necessarily going to be out of the question for people to be like, oh, OK, I can get strawberries mid Halloween weekend. <laughs> that sounds so exciting, though. I, I think that sounds amazing. I would go to yeah. a I would go to an apple orchard, pumpkin patch, strawberry patch. You pick any any fall. That sounds and, great. And that's what we hope. I mean, right now, with one of our sites being at an apple orchard without any irrigation, the strawberries came on board the week they opened up for for you pick apples like mm. you, you can't you can't uh, you can't complain about that like no. you know if you've got that ability to to do it um but we just still have to step back and think about all the labor and economics that goes into it and whether it really makes a lot of sense fiscal sense really speaking of the economics since you're growing these as an annual i mean is there that much how much more is it going to cost somebody to do this compared to like a perennial june bearing yeah, I mean, that that's one of the big pieces that we, um, you know, there is some research out there that says that in order for this to be justified, in order for it to work, you have to, you know, I, I forget what the amount of money per, per quart of strawberries is, but it is going to require charging a little bit more than you're expecting. And you're exactly right. I mean, you know, it's going to be an additional labor point of view to plant these every year. You're having to remove the runner, runners weekly. Um, if you decide to not do it as a U pick, you now have to pay workers to go out there compared to, say, June bearing strawberries, where you've got the cost going in a single year for, for those plants and then planting and, and so forth. So when we are doing the research, I am trying to uh, do a lot of uh, a set of timer just to kind of know how long it's taken me to do weed management, runner removal, harvest, things like that, so that when we can extrapolate that with some economics so that they can kind of see with it. So for runners, do they send out a lot of runners like June bearing where you get like a carpet after a while or are they not as prolific? I find that to be pretty prolific and it's nonstop. Um, and especially with this annual kind of system, and I'll, I'll show you some photos at later on today too. Um, you know, that's just one piece that's just kind of not uh, continual. And especially if you can't find a runner, like if you have thought you've removed all the runners and then you've had a single week where now this runner has started to establish, um, there's some concern that now we're losing some strawberries off of it because of it. All right, then one last question for me, then Chris can go. Um, so the, do these fall bearing, do they taste any different than your June bearing? Is there a noticeable difference or? I don't find any difference. I mean, shape is great, quality looks very good. Um, this study does not get into um, sugar content evaluation. Um, our hope is, I think, next year that we'll be at a place to be doing some evaluations on, on taste. Um, I think at this point, we just needed to kind of see what the shape looks like. Um, I will say that when I bring in the strawberries from the field, I don't get any, if that tells you how good these are. Um, I have been the one that has picked and harvested and, and babied these strawberries. <laughs> and I get maybe three or four. <laughs> so um sounds about right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's about right, actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, ideally for this to work, each plant needs to produce about one to one and a half pounds of strawberries over the course of their season. So, mm -hmm. and that of course is tied with the quality of the fruit the two we've we have three varieties albion seascape and mara de bois albion is a california variety a very strong typical strawberry shape to it very good flavor with it one that's been evaluated for annual strawberry production um seascape has also been one too the mixed bag one i bit of is mara de bois it's a smaller strawberry a french variety 
the flavor is very good. It's a very powerful flavor with it, but it probably would work better for a value added than a U pick is what I would imagine, just based on its shape and what you're really after there. Kind of in line with with flavor and and harvest. I mean, we, we treat these fall strawberries just like we treat June bearing, right? So we pop them in our mouth. We chop them up and I, sometimes I throw a little sugar on it. So I'll, I'll admit to that. Um, but, but you like, you just prepare them the same way, right? There's nothing different to these. Yeah, there's, there's nothing different with them. And I think the, the benefit with these is especially because you're treating it as an annual strawberry and the plant is staying really compact and not going everywhere. The strawberries are there or they're not there. Like they're really just around the center of that plant. So from a management point of view, like, I mean, I can see where these strawberries are and if they're not there, they're not gonna be there. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, really the plant looks no different than the June bearing other than how we're treating it and, and how we're trying to kind of structure it. And it's not asking too much of it, you know, just removing of the runners and especially sometimes even weed management with it too. Is there any difference in disease pressure with uh, an annual type strawberry crop versus the the perennial because I know the perennial ones they get anthracnose and they get they can get all kinds of foliar diseases is that different with an annual type um you know at this point we haven't seen too much disease pressure with the day neutrals what we have seen quite a bit is is it feels like everything else um <laughs> you know we you have to recognize that when you're growing June bearing strawberries or some of those others, you have such a short season in there where the fruit is available, those three to four weeks typically. And so once you're done with that and the fruit is removed, then you know, you're know you managing the plants perhaps, but you're not too concerned with it. When you stretch out harvest from you know strawberries ripening from the first week of July to November 1st, you now have a huge <laughs> window of pest pressure mm -hmm. that is sometimes nonstop. Um, you know, we, it, one of our sites, because it's mixed vegetable, you're dealing with just, you know, a, a wave of insects moving in and out because it's beside everything else that is having insect pressure too. Uh, we've had tons of ligus bug damage that, you know, that damage early on to the fruit is leaning to fruit that is just not the best shape that you're really after. Um, we have had uh, small mammal issues, mice. We've had some mice issues that we've had to kind of control the, the border areas with. Uh, we now have shifted into wasps. So now yellow jackets mm -hmm. have moved in to berries that have not been picked in time. Um, I don't know what's going to happen next. <laughs> I guess that's <laughs> what I was going to say. But it is something to consider, you know, like if you are thinking about like the return of these and the return of value of them is that yeah, you have a long season, but gosh, that's a long season of pest management that yeah. you have to really consider. Um, and um, I think the the bigger concern is the ligus insects, the ones that, you know, with those mouth parts, the damage that they're really doing is leading to fruit shapes that's just really not what you're after. And it makes a crop that's just not, you know, I, I love you. Obviously, you pick with yellow jackets is not the most fun either. Um, so uh, it's something to consider. Mm -hmm. It's like Ken and his tomatoes. He's, he's sick of them. He's done with them. Tear them out. <laughs> so, exactly. And it's something to think about. I mean, especially if you had, say, six weeks of strawberries and you felt the strawberries were good, it's September 1st or so forth. And you're like, yeah, we're done for the season, right? Mm -hmm. Like You could certainly get away with that. Um, and I don't think there'd be anything wrong with that either. Spotted wing drosophila. That was big news years ago. Is that still big news with uh, this, a late season fruit crop like this? Uh, we're, we're not seeing it too much, you know, and I think part of it could be that there's been some better control measures in place. And I think it is something to be concerned with because it still is a very soft fruit. And I know that certainly sometimes it can impact fall raspberry production. Um, I think one thing that is is enhancing as there's a continual picking of these berries, sometimes twice a week. So that's kind of helping to, to, to do that a, a bit more. Um, but I think it could still be a concern. We, we just haven't evaluated it as much as we probably should. So you talk about these being annual. Do you know what, if like 
say you didn't pull them out in October and just let them go? Like, will they keep producing yearly or they just kind of peter out after a while? Do you know? The ones that I, so I, I grew some day neutrals in, at my home summer 2021 and then they overwintered um, into the spring of 2022 and summer 22. Um, and I had done very similar to what I'm doing now where I removed the runners and I kind of manage them the day neutral. But in that situation, I overwintered them. I found that they didn't produce. I felt like they were just so focused on growth and other things that they did not produce well for me. Now, I don't, I don't know if sometimes these are varieties that like with Chris's strawberry, where it doesn't know what it is, where it may have gotten into kind of a potentially an ever bearing situation where maybe in the springtime, it was going to now <laughs> decide to be ever bearing. And so if I had waited for it to be impacted by day length, Perhaps I could have had strawberries in, in July, perhaps, but at least from what I was able to see and tell, I, we didn't see that. Um, one of our farms that we're working with um, does want to overwinter them. So, you know, we will we'll see what happens there if there is, you know, a little bit of a, like what we might see of like a dual crop where you could have your day neutrals, the one the summer beforehand, it overwinters, and then you could have another bit of a flush of strawberries. That, that season. Um, for the most part though, it's just not something that's recommended or, or utilized. Would you want to look at some pictures? I've talked about them. Would you like to actually look at them? That would be, that, yeah, that'd be awesome. <laughs> let's, um, let's give you that power. So yeah, I, uh, so I'll share with you a couple of, of kind of what the season has kind of looked like. Some of the things we've already talked about, but you can at least kind of see what we're kind of dealing with here. Um, you know, you see over here kind of the bare root strawberries that we commonly would order as day neutrals. Um, and so these arrived May, the first week of May. They were planted the first week of May at our two sites, the one, uh, the mixed vegetable operation in Freeport, Stevenson County and then at the orchard in um, Joe Davis County. Both are growing the same varieties, spacing is the same. The only major difference being that one is plastic culture, drip irrigation and mixed vegetable. And then the other one, there's no irrigation and there's no plastic culture system showing up. Um, for those first six weeks, really we're doing flower removal and we're removing any of the runners. And then you can see July 14th, uh, 2022, this is really where we start to see flower production for the first time. So four to six weeks from, from this is when we're expecting strawberries. And that's what wow. we saw um, was that. Um, the idea with the runner removal and the flower removal those first six weeks is just to get the plant established. Um, and I think you were up here, Ken, that first, the week that we were planting, and I don't know if you remember, it was just extremely hot. Um, for northern <laughs> Illinois. Yes, so that have, first week of May was awful. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we're hoping next year will be a little bit different because we lost some, but they still have yet recovered. And you can see the runners uh, from July 14th. You know, this is something we're still removing. We're still removing a ton of runners every single week. And uh, we've not, I've not really let any of these runners persist. I've just kind of done you know what we know as best practices to remove these you know based on what the guidance is um we are working with high school students at the freeport location and so the high school students this is their vegetable csa program so they're very involved in the removal of the runners and the harvest of these berries and so one of their weekly tasks really is the removal of these runners you can see here and this is kind of a side by side of both sides so you see july 28th this is our plastic culture system. This is our drip irrigation at the mixed vegetable operation. We had some weed issues on both sides, which was leading to some of our insect pressure problems. So we had to get those under control because they were just hiding there waiting to move in uh, with them. Um, this was also the first week we did a harvest that week of July 28th. And then the other side you see here on the, on the right, this is without any, irrigation without any plastic culture. The plants look pretty similar, to be honest. Um, they look very similar in their color and in their growth. But they're hand watering, are they? Or just rainfall, you said? Just rainfall. Just rainfall. Yeah. And, you know, it, what was important about this study was that 
in finding farm partners, it was to do whatever they do. You know, it is that the mixed vegetable operation does drip irrigation, plastic culture. Um, the orchard, they have fields of strawberry you pick for June bearing and they don't irrigate either. So we're mm -hmm. not gonna, we're gonna do what they're gonna do because that's what a grower is gonna do. They're not gonna yeah. put something in that they wouldn't. And that also gets back to your economics then too, if you're thinking about, you know, plastic culture versus non-plastic culture. So almost every plant kind of looks like this on the left here. You know, when we think about strawberry plants um, and what the, where the flower clusters are, they're sometimes covered in 25 and 30 flowers. I mean, they're just covered in berries uh, and they're pretty consistent throughout the season being covered in these flowers. Um, I'll show you a photo at the end that's from last week. There still are flowers on these strawberries. It's just, it's, it's fascinating and really amazing to see. Um, and then on the right here, you see some of the ligus bug damage where, you know, that early, the, uh, early um, damage really impacts how that fruit is shaping up there at the top. So it will still ripen, but at least from what I've been able to tell, it, it's that insect damage. And Ken, you're the entomologist, so you might have some better ideas too. I thought it was ligus bug most of the time. Yeah, that cat facing is kind of, <clears throat> that or stink bug is kind of consistent with that piercing sucking mouth part. Right, yeah, and that, that's what I was kind of noticing too. And we went to a spray schedule uh, because of that. Uh, you notice uh, the bottom photo, this is also um, now what we're dealing with are yellow jackets. Um, so it's a, it's a very, uh, you have to be very nimble when you're harvesting strawberries, that's what we're finding out. Um, and then this is last week. So on the left here, you see is strawberries that were taken from Terrapin orchards, the one that doesn't have any irrigation or plastic culture. Uh, fruit quality is wonderful. And then on the right there, you see what a typical strawberry looks like from these fields. I mean, they look like anything else out there. Um, they look like grocery store strawberries, but with much better flavor. They mm -hmm. look like your June bearing strawberries uh, with it too. Um, so, and flavor is still good. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, we, we haven't been able to necessarily compare the June bearing flavor compared to these just because there's not an overlap. I think that would be something to really look at is that if one of these was, if there was any overlap between them of harvest, we might really be able to do some taste testing with them and evaluate them. But to be getting this type of quality berry out in the field, September 15th in Northern Illinois, <laughs> you know. They're beautiful. This is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I mean, we, we, we knew it would work. We're still surprised it's working as well. As that, <laughs> um, and you can see there, you know, with these last photos here, um, we still have strawberries. Like they're still flowering. They're still coming in. We'll evaluate them to just kind of see if we're getting you know, the, the pounds per plant that we're really expecting. And then we also will have another year of this study to really be able to just see like, was this just a, a fluke of a year or is this consistently what we kind of expect? You do see a little bit of uh, disease pressure up in that uh, on the left photo, a little bit higher up, a little bit like angular leaf spot, but otherwise we don't see near the amount of disease that we that you might see. And you know, it gets back to your point, Chris, too, about disease questions. By treating it like an annual crop, we also are reducing disease severity. We're not going to be dealing with that. And especially if I was a grower that just kept dealing with disease problems, this might be a route to go. Grant, you've done it again. <laughs> <laughs> I now have a whole slate of strawberries I want to grow. So I need a bigger yard. Well, and I know you're interested in caterpillar tunnels, and these thrive in caterpillar tunnels. Um, some of the other strawberry research is also looking at kind of a tray system. It's it's almost that uh, chest height, mm -hmm. and so you're yeah. able to just kind of it's almost like a gutter system in a way. I think, yeah. um, and those uh, you know are are very adaptable for these systems, and where a lot of folks are kind of thinking about, especially from like a U pick standpoint. Um, you know, it's it's at the end of you know we're we're still in the middle of it. We're, I I still have more weeks to go, but you know I can comfortably say that 
if I'm a homeowner, check them out, try them mm -hmm. out. I think you're going to have a really great time with them. Um, you know, recognize that pest pressure is going to be there much longer than maybe you want. Um, but I think it also works really well in an annual system. Um, you might also consider irrigation because I think irrigation does increase those yields closer to when you want them to be. However, you know, if you're starting to get burnt out mid-August, um, recognize that, you know, you're going to have strawberries September and yes. October in most cases. Um, so if, if I do have space in a caterpillar tunnel, what about fertility? Can they, is it okay if they're, an, if there's an injection going on for tomatoes, will these respond favorably to a, a soluble liquid feeding? They should. They should be pretty responsive to that. Um, you know, I think if it's a balanced fertilizer that's allowing for kind of the yep. growth of, of every piece of it, yeah. you, you will probably respond well with that. Um, okay. We did not do any sort of fertility uh, plan this season. We really just wanted to kind of see how they would just do based on, you know, what, um, what the soil conditions were. Um, that will probably be something in the future we might look at is just to kind of get it back on scale, especially if we could be able to move, um, get earlier yields compared to say kind of the, some of these, what we might consider later yields. Say somebody at home wants to do this. Um, what about weed control in these? You mentioned doing it some on plastic, some bare ground. Um, how would the best way to do that? And is that gonna vary from your typical June bearing for your weed management? Mm -hmm. um, with these, especially with strawberries, they're just poor competitors with weeds. Weeds can take over quite quickly. And, you know, what we would recommend is to be very mindful of where the site is. If you're going to be planting these, if it's heavily infested with something that's a very vine-like weed, I think you would be better off avoiding that area. Um, you will sometimes find that many of especially for annual strawberries and these day neutral ones, we have found there's very few herbicides available for managing them. Um, they're just not listed for this production based on the flowering and the fruiting period uh, of these. Um, so, you know, that's that some to consider. Compared to like June bearing though, where typically you kind of will use say some straw mulch, these would be great for that. Um, these would probably even have a better fruit quality for you by using a straw mulch. I probably wait maybe after that six week period for establishment before putting a straw mulch down. Um, but certainly, you know, there's been a lot of research to show that the quality of fruit can be much better. Uh, by having a mulch layer underneath it. That will probably be something that we might do in the future is also do some straw mulch just because it's, um, it's a lot of hand weeding. Mm -hmm. I am <laughs> hand weeding. <laughs> oh, but Grant, it's fun. It's fun. Isn't this fun? <laughs> this is fun. When you, this is fun you know, stuff. Chris, when you set your timer for how long it took you to weed an area, it, it brings a lot more context. Oh, to... <laughs> I guess. Yes, it would. It's You're suddenly yeah. like, wow, that... Okay, I've done way uh, a, a lot more weeding than I expected. Yeah, you also oh. appreciate how small your plot is when you look at that timer and you think, "Okay, how?" I'm so glad this is this is much smaller <laughs> than. Oh my god! Builds character, right? Oh, sure, sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, Grant McCarty, local food small farms educator, U of I Extension. Thank you so much for being here, sharing with us all of the fun things that you've grown this year, especially um, your work on day neutral strawberries. Uh, I, like I said, I'm going to the catalogs that are right behind me and I'm going to start flipping through them and order a couple. <laughs> so yeah, it's like a drug. I can't stop. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for having me. Well, the Good Growing Podcast is a production of University of Illinois Extension, and a big thanks to my co-host, Ken Johnson, with me every single week. Thank you very much, Ken. Yes, thank you, Grant. I too will also have to look into this. We, <laughs> we need to have you on in the spring so we can talk about what we're growing beforehand. In the, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That can, that can compare be after. Before. <laughs> I, actually, before it's after. Been, it has been requested by a few listeners that we need to do a spring session where we go just... we. Or just flipping through catalogs and be like and just picking out stuff so uh, it's like a special request yeah <laughs> so
maybe being contacted <laughs> sometime oh. down the road. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you, Chris. And let's do this again next week. Oh, we shall do this again next week. We'll be chatting about another fun fall gardening topic. Uh, so listeners, uh, just really appreciate you and thank you for doing what you do best. And that is listening. Or if you're watching us on YouTube, watching. And as always, keep on growing.